Today we want to continue our video series about the life of Ferdinand Porsche and take a closer look at his time at the Austrian Daimler company. Until now, Porsche made a name for himself at Lona with electric and hybrid cars with front and all-wheel drive. His cars avoided lossy shafts, which were a constant source of reliability issues, and instead he transmitted power through electric cables. Another advantage was that the huge generator on the crankshaft acted as a starter, so Porsche cars didn't have to be cranked to start, and hence had less risk of injuries. With this concept, he could win races and set records. And not just that, he drove the Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand around in his hybrid car at a military exercise in 1902. The Archduke was deeply impressed and remembered the name Porsche. And he used his mixed hybrid car to take his wife Aloysia to Nizza to their honeymoon in 1903. As we heard in the last part, Jelinek's exclusive Daimler contract was running out in 1905. When his Daimler broke down at the Semmering race in 1905, Porsche stopped and helped him. While Porsche was fixing his car, Jelinek talked about his plans to modernize the old-fashioned Austrian Daimler factory, and he was deeply impressed by Porsche's skills. Current director at the Austrian Daimler company was Paul Daimler, who was called back to the mother company Daimler in Stuttgart, in Germany. And Jelinek, as the biggest Austro-Daimler investor, knew who would be the successor. Ferdinand Porsche. He was in a fight with his former boss Lona about his wheel hub motor patent anyway, and so he left Lona and took his patents with him. He started as technical director at the Austrian Daimler company in 1906. It was a big step for Porsche. Instead of experimenting with a small team at Lona, he now had a whole established car factory underneath him. Porsche lived in the Berggasse in Vienna and tested his cars there in the night, because of less traffic, but his neighbors didn't like it. Later, he moved to Wiener Neustadt, the headquarter of his new employer, which is a smaller city 50 kilometers south of Vienna. His wife Aloysia was literally by his side. She didn't just come to races, she was often passenger and also drove his creations herself. So when Porsche came to Austro Daimler, he built his Lona concept again. But this time, for commercial vehicles like trucks, buses, fire engines, ambulances, post and military cars, with rear-wheel drive, so the axle with higher load. Jelinek founded the company Mercedes Electrique in Paris in 1906, so he reached his goal of using Porsche's innovative designs under his daughter's name Mercedes. But Jelinek mainly brought Porsche to Austro Daimler to build a new combustion engine car. And after the success of using his older daughter's name Mercedes for his race cars, he wanted to promote Porsche's new car with his younger daughter's name, Maya. Jelinek demanded a traditional car with rear-wheel drive and combustion engine. The result was a design which was unlike Porsche's previous creations and Porsche's first designed combustion engine. He designed a 5.7-liter four-cylinder engine with an ignition distributor, a two-piston oil pump, two camshafts and double ignition. It was the first Austrian vehicle in this class and sold internationally. Nevertheless, the Maya was a flop. Reasons were problems with the first gearbox and the first car market crisis. Jelinek lost interest in the car industry, sold all of his shares and concentrated on his career as diplomat. Porsche developed the engine further and in 1909 it was powering the Parseval airship PL4. That was Porsche's first contact with aircrafts. His engine was not ideal as it was originally designed for a car, as were all aircraft engines at that time. So when the Austrian military was looking for a powerful aircraft engine from Austrian production to keep up with the competition, Austro Daimler got the project. Now Porsche had the task to design an aircraft engine from scratch. And here we see again that for Porsche there are no sacred cows. He designs whatever is best from an engineering perspective. Aircrafts were still very new and there was not much experience with them. Porsche decided that high power, low weight and high reliability would be the priority. Instead of a heavy stomping engine like his previous four-cylinder, he decided for a straight six-cylinder engine. He didn't invent the straight six as Spyker for example used it years before, but Porsche saw the advantages and pushed it to the limit. 
To create a powerful engine, Porsche decided against air cooling and for water cooling. So he didn't have to position each cylinder in the wind like a star engine. The straight six cylinder is slim and has the same frontal area as a four cylinder engine. It's running very smooth, so there are less vibrations, which could cause further problems. To reduce weight, he chose an aluminium crankcase and bolted on cast iron cylinders. To get more power, he wanted to get more gas into the cylinders and more out, so he chose four valves per cylinder. Double ignition for two flames inside the combustion chamber, hence faster ignition and the possibility of higher revs and hence more power again. He positioned the cold inlet on the left and the hot exhaust on the right, as pilots would get into the plane from the left, just like with a horse. And that is a design convention which we can find on straight six-cylinder engines until today. To avoid any reliability issues and maintenance with push rods, he used one overhead camshaft, driven by a shaft at the front. Cooling is only applied to the cylinder head of the engine, and because in a plane lubrication in all flight situations is important, Porsche designed basically a dry sump system with an oil scavenge pump, sucking oil from the engine and pushing it only to the important points. Because of all this, there was no big oil sump. The frontal area was even smaller and lubrication could be guaranteed in any flight conditions. But the first tests in 1910 were disappointing. The engine only produced 65 horsepower and hence was not interesting for the military. But Porsche created a great basis which had lots of potential for much more. In 1912 the engine already produced 100 horsepower, 120 in 1913, 150 in 1914, 160 in 1915, then 185 and more than 200 horsepower at the end of the war. So all these design solutions were not cheap, but it offered superior performance. The Austro 6 was so popular that it was copied by many other companies abroad. Like the German Daimler company, which was a separate company and competitor since 1910, Benz, and it was the role model for the famous BMW 3A, which secured the survival of BMW as an independent engine manufacturer in 1917. And since then, the straight six-cylinder engine is the symbol of BMW engineering. So also that traces back to Porsche. Anyway, while designing this aircraft engine, Porsche also designed the Maya car further to a proper race car for the so-called Prinz Heinrich Fahrt in 1910. Prinz Heinrich was the brother of the German Emperor Wilhelm II and a motorsport fan. He sponsored the almost 2000 km long race through Germany, which basically worked like the Dakar Rally today. It lasted for 7 days, while the 4th day was a rest day. Competitors had to drive huge distances between cities and difficult landscape, with special stages in between. These special stages were high-speed races, and because cars at that time were already pretty reliable, your only chance to win the race was to win the special stages. So Porsche optimized his car for top speed. He used a super narrow body and small headlights with aerodynamic covers for less drag. He rounded all edges to avoid separations and used a boat tail at the back for less wake. There was no windscreen and he demanded passengers, so mechanic and the mandatory judge, to duck down on high speed stages. In the end, the three Porsche cars locked out the podium with Porsche driving the winning car himself. It was a huge success for Austro Daimler. A year before, when Porsche was just winning his class at the Semmering race in 1909, his son Ferdinand Anton Ernst Porsche, called Ferry, was born in Wiener Neustadt. He basically grew up at the desk of his father, who took him to all races. When he was 11, he should get his first own car as a Christmas present. Because Ferry already had a clue and constantly asked his father about it, he said, you will get a billy goat with trailer. When he really got the car for Christmas, everyone just called the vehicle billy goat car. In German, Ziegenbockwagen. The Austro Daimler workshop built the car for their boss's son with a two-cylinder four-stroke engine with three and a half horsepower. Ferry got along with the car very well and even participated in races in 1920, after the car was tuned to six horsepower. From 1910 to 1914, the hardest rally in Europe was the so-called Alpenfahrt. Austro Daimler participated with three cars, driven by Technical Director Porsche, Director Fischer and Race Driver Schönfeld. 
They helped each other and won all five Alpenfahrt events from 1910 to 1914. In the meantime, the military was looking for a way to easily transport heavy goods in off-road conditions. They asked Porsche and Porsche pulled out his old Lona concept again. He designed the so-called Landwehr train. It consisted of a generator car with an around 100 kW straight six-cylinder engine and a 90 kW generator. It was driving the rear axle of the generator car with wheel hub motors. Each trailer has its own electric wheel hub motors, sometimes all-wheel drive, vacuum brakes and a suspension which keeps every trailer in the same track. It can carry heavy goods up steep hills, is great for off-road and can drive on land and on rails. The conversion takes only 45 minutes. The train can have 6 to 10 trailers and was very popular. Another Porsche design was the so-called Daimler Pferd or Kraftprotze. It's an air-cooled four-cylinder engine and gearbox driving two large metal wheels to pull heavy loads. It was super simple and popular. Porsche designed a mechanism to extend shovels out of the wheels for muddy surfaces, but his solution was too complex. A young engineer called Karl Rabe designed a simple and elegant solution to extend shovels while the wheels are spinning. Porsche was impressed and Karl Rabe became one of his closest engineers. In 1916, Porsche becomes director at Austro Daimler. In 1917, Porsche becomes Dr. Engineer Honoris Causa of Vienna's Technical University for his achievements for Austria in the war, although Porsche never studied. Porsche became tinsmith in his father's workshop and went to some evening lectures in his free time. Now he is a doctor and we find this in Porsche's company name to this day. In 1918 he should have become royal, but because the Austrian monarchy collapsed at the end of the war, it didn't come to that. Because of his birthplace near Zittau, which now became the new Czechoslovakian state, he could get the Czechoslovakian citizenship, which allowed him to still travel abroad to races and car shows. But Porsche never spoke anything else than German. In 1920 Austro Daimler cooperated with Austro Fiat and Puch. They produced the luxury six-cylinder AD617. But Porsche felt like it was not the right time for such a luxury car right after the war. He wanted to build a small, simple and cheap car, something people could afford. The board of Austro Daimler wasn't convinced and didn't allow any budget. Porsche, as always, wanted to test new designs in motorsport and thought good results in races could convince the board. He reached out to one of his racing contacts, his previous competitor, Alexander Josef Graf Kolovrat Krakowski, nicknamed Sascha. He was the founder of the Austrian movie industry. He discovered Marlene Dietrich, was a shareholder of Austro Daimler, motorsport fan and hobby race driver. He agreed on financing a small nimble Porsche race car to test the technology for a simple car for everyone. Because he paid the project, the car was named after him. Sascha. The goal was to race in the Targa Florio 1922, the hardest race at that time. Porsche used a small 1.1 liter engine, mounted it further back and super low for a low center of gravity. He used aluminium bodywork, which was very expensive at that time. The overall weight was only 598 kg with a balance of 53 to 47. The wide engine block is bolted directly to the chassis to increase stiffness and for more direct response. Porsche used the experiences of the past with aerodynamic bodywork, four brakes, the passenger further back for a slimmer car and as much weight saving as possible. The frame was shortened, the rear life axle just hanging at the leaf springs and there was no rear bodywork. Funny today seems that the clutch is on the left, the brake on the right and the throttle in the middle. It reached a top speed of 144 km per hour with just 50 horsepower. After his military service, a certain Alfred Neubauer came to Austro Daimler and worked in the test department. Porsche made him one of the race drivers and he participated with the Sascha and the Targa Florio. The four cars were finished just before the race. They were painted during the train ride to Italy. And they were painted in red so they won't get stolen in Italy because no one steals a red car, the national color of Italian race cars. Graf Kolovrat used card symbols to identify the red cars. 
They used three times a 1.1 liter engine in the class for small cars and one 1.5 liter engine in the open Corsa class. Kolovrat unfortunately had an engine failure, but Gregor Kuhn won and Lambert Pocher reached second place in their class. Neubauer in the 1.5 liter car in the open class reached 19th position overall, although other cars had more than five times the power, and Neubauer was just 8 km per hour slower in average speed. That was a sensation. This tiny little car, well balanced and with low weight, was so capable that for Porsche lightweight technology became a priority. So the Sascha project became very important for Porsche. It was the first time he designed a people's car, he had great success in racing with it, and he worked on it with people who would become very important in his later career. We should also note that Porsche teaches young capable engineers on Saturdays and they discuss specific engineering challenges. We will hear about them later again. Unfortunately, Gregor Kuhn, class winner of the Targa Florio, dies five months later on the newly opened Monza circuit at the Italian Grand Prix 1922 in Sascha. Despite the huge success, the Austro Daimler board and their bank are still not convinced and drastically cut Porsche's racing budget. Additionally, they say Austria is a too small market for a mass production people's car. They didn't have to pay for the development costs and have a great design in front of them now, but they were still not willing to produce this car, and instead wanted to continue with luxury cars. Because of that, Porsche got into a fight with the chairman of the board, Camillo Castiglione, man behind Semperi tires and the creator of the brand BMW, but that's stuff for another video. So again, the atmosphere for Porsche wasn't right anymore, and he was looking for a new job. Months earlier, the Daimler management in Stuttgart bullied the founder's son and technical director Paul Daimler out of the company, just like they have done it with Wilhelm Maybach 15 years earlier, and the same as they would do five years later with Porsche. So now, they are looking for a technical director, and Porsche is the man. Just like 17 years earlier, he is following Paul Daimler again on the job. The Austrian Daimler board said about Porsche, he is a genius engineer, but you need a cage with seven locks for him, so he cannot update his drawings anymore after he submitted them. Again, Porsche's designs became too expensive for the management. He laid the foundations for years of success, but now he was leaving again. And now, Porsche's time in Stuttgart starts. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please consider to become a B-Sport Club member for early access and more videos like this. See you at the next one.